Our next keynote is from Dr. Mate Zaharia. Now, due to unforeseen circumstances, he was unable to travel and be with us here today. However, he remained committed, and he knew how important this community is, so he was able to record his keynote address. So we have that on video, and we're going to share that with you. He's going to talk about Dawn, which is the infrastructure for usable machine learning. So we're going to sit through that 20-minute video. He's going to deliver the entire keynote as he planned here. So he sends his apologies, as do we from the conference. But we have him here on video. So let's go ahead and roll that video. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be at the conference in person because I know you've got an amazing program for today, uh, but I'm still excited to give you my uh, talk um, about uh, Dawn, which is a research project um, I'm involved in at Stanford on infrastructure for usable machine learning. And this is a project with three other professors there, uh, Peter, Kunle, um, and Chris. So as everyone uh, knows, uh, it's currently the golden age of data. We're seeing incredible advances uh, every day in what you can do with data and machine learning, including image recognition, natural language, uh, information retrieval, and so on. And these are starting to have society scale impact through products like self-driving cars, um, real-time translation, or personalized medicine. And there seems to be no end in sight to these advances. But there is actually a caveat associated with this story, which is it is the golden age of data, but only for the best funded and best trained engineering teams. When you look at all the successful machine learning products, every successful um, product has required a team of hundreds to thousands of engineers to build it. So this is large products like Siri or Alexa or Autopilot. And then when you look at what these engineers are doing, the interesting thing is most of them are not machine learning PhDs, you know, sitting around a whiteboard and doing math. Uh, actually, most of the effort is in the infrastructure to feed the machine learning uh, application. So this includes data preparation, model tuning, uh, QA, and then productionizing. And what this means is that uh, just domain experts, so say someone who's just an expert in medicine, can't easily build machine learning products. They need this whole team of hundreds of engineers in order to, uh, to, to, to move their work into production and actually apply it at scale. We're not the only people to point this out. Um, actually, there's this really interesting uh, paper from Google from a few years back that looks at where the effort goes into building ML systems. And what they show is that only a small fraction of these systems com uh, you know, contains machine learning code. That's the little black box in the middle here. Everything else around it is the data preparation code to feed uh, the machine learning algorithm, and then all the work to run it in production, run it efficiently, run it at scale, and monitor it. So the question we're uh, trying to tackle in Dawn is how can we enable anyone who's just a domain expert in some area to build production quality ML applications uh, without needing a PhD in machine learning, but also without being an expert in big data systems or understanding the latest hardware and basically building a complete stack from scratch. And to address this problem, we're working on algorithms and systems across the whole machine learning lifecycle, all focused on enabling smaller teams to quickly do more with machine learning. So these range all the way from data acquisition to production, and they also range from new interfaces, like, for example, how are you supposed to debug a machine learning application, um, and all the way down to algorithms, uh, systems, and hardware. And today, I'm just going to give you an overview of two of the projects that I'm involved in at the algorithms and uh, systems level to give you a sense of the type of work that we do. So I'm going to start with a project um, called NoScope, uh, which focuses on a really important problem with uh, today's machine learning models, with deep learning models in particular, which is efficient inference. Deep learning models are very powerful, but by definition, they're also very large and very expensive to run, and that makes them prohibitively expensive for many applications. In NoScope in particular, we looked at accelerating um, video analytics using CNNs, convolutional neural networks. So CNNs, as I'm sure everyone is aware, um, have allowed more accurate visual queries than ever, um, often approaching human accuracy, and they can do things like detect objects in a video or classify them. 
But the problem is that state-of-the-art CNNs are also very expensive. So when you look in the computer vision literature, even at the ones optimized for speed, when they say, oh, we have a real-time you know, object detection CNN, what that means is it can process one video stream um, at 30 frames per second in real time on, a, on an entire GPU. And that's way too expensive if you have you know, historical data or even if you have a, you know, a modest size building, like say a factory with a bunch of cameras in there. You're gonna need a multi-million dollar GPU cluster just to churn through that in a reasonable time. So in NoScope, we've developed a set of techniques that let you go two to three orders of magnitude faster and cheaper uh, with less than 1% loss in accuracy when answering these visual queries. And I'm not going to go into detail on all of the techniques, but I'll explain one of them, which is model specialization. So this, this, is, this is an idea that comes up in CNNs, also comes up in other machine learning applications, which is when you've trained a deep model, you train it on a wide range of data. These models can usually recognize thousands of classes of objects. They've been trained on objects in many different um, uh, you know, situations, camera angles, configurations, and so on. But then when you have a real application, like let's say I want to count how many cars are driving uh, you know, by, uh, by, by my factory or something like that, uh, it's a specific way, specific object you're looking for, and in a restricted data distribution. Like maybe this is a camera perched on top of the building and it's not looking for cars that are flying upside down or anything like that. So what we use is we leverage that to train a much smaller specialized model to answer your query. We take the target model, which is highly accurate. We take a sample of the video stream that you want to apply it on. And then we use these to train a specialized model that's much smaller, but aims to predict what the big model would have said on the query. And the cool thing about this technique is the specialized model also outputs a confidence score. So when the specialized model is not sure about what's in the frame, uh, we can still call the big model. So on a large percent of frames, we get away with just running the specialized one, and uh, it's highly accurate on those. And then on a small percent of frames, we can still call the big model and still get a good result. So basically, NoScope uses this technique plus a cost-based optimizer that basically puts together a cascade of specialized models and uh, also other types of models like difference detectors to detect when to run these um, in order to automatically create an optimized pipeline for answering a specific way. And how does it do in practice? Uh, it turns out you can get really significant speed ups with minimal cost to accuracy. Um, so in this example, I'm showing basically the best and worst examples from our paper. And in both cases, we can go uh, close to 40 times faster while losing just 0.1% in accuracy, which is already a pretty good start. And if you're willing to lose a little bit more, like 1%, uh, you, can, you can often go hundreds of times faster. Or if you're willing to lose 4%, which might be okay for say something like a counting query, you can actually go uh, 5,000 times faster in, in this sort of best case. Um, so this is a pretty general technique that could be applied to other forms of machine learning as well. Really powerful for putting these into production. It lets you get the accuracy of these expensive models and actually run uh, this thing on a reasonable budget. And the work is open source. I also invite you uh, to check out our paper to read more. Okay. So NoScope was one example of a project in the algorithm space, again, tackling one of these uh, infrastructure problems. Uh, the next project I'm going to talk about is a little bit bigger, and it's in the hardware and system space. It's a compiler that's called Weld for accelerating both the data preparation and inference sides of machine learning. And compilers are, in general, a technique we're using throughout the stack to basically automate a lot of the work that currently requires handing off your code to a separate engineering team that's going to optimize it. So this is to enable people to use high-level APIs and get really high performance and scaling for both training and serving. So just to give a little bit of background um, on Weld, um, basically the way people write data intensive applications today is by composing lots of libraries. Um, so for example, if you look at uh, you know, Python uh, data science, the whole point is that there are hundreds of packages you can mix and match. Same with Apache Spark and R and so on. Um, and so every library, um, uh, you know, every application starts by combining them. For example, maybe you do data cleaning in pandas, uh, and then you do some further preparation in NumPy to do some numerical stuff, and then you, you pass stuff into scikit-learn. 
Now, the problem with this is even though library developers might modify, might optimize the individual functions, and they often do, they write these things in C, C++, uh, it turns out that composing high-level functions this way can lead to very inefficient applications. And so this is the reason why a lot of these handwritten applications don't scale well and are much slower than if you gave it you know, to a specialized software engineer who would build a production version of the app. And the problem is actually that the traditional way library composition happens uh, turns out to be inefficient for data intensive code. In particular, in pretty much every programming language people use, the traditional way you compose libraries is through function calls. And so the contract is each function takes a pointer to some data and memory that it's supposed to work on, then you jump into it, it runs some code, and then it writes back the data again to memory. And you know, if you've got a small amount of data, this is fine, it, it doesn't cost very much, but for a large amount of data, these reads and writes to memory can dominate. As an example, here's a very simple uh, data science application using a couple of pandas functions to parse a CSV and then computing a mean. Um, Turns out these, these pandas and numpy functions are all heavily optimized. They're basically written in C, so each function is really fast. But if you look at what this application does when running, um, it will actually scan over memory many, many times just to compute this result. So in this case, we start, say, with a string in memory. First, we scan through it to parse CSV, and then we write out a whole other result. Next thing we do, we've just written that out. Now we read it back, uh, stream it through the processor again to call drop in A, and we write something else. And then finally, we stream through that again to compute a mean and write something. So we've actually streamed through the memory four or five times in total to compute this result, um, even though you know we just want this really tiny result. Um, and it turns out that um, in, in, in many functions people use, the cost of streaming in and out of memory just dominates compared to the computation. The CPU can do way more work, um, you know, can, can do way more cycles uh, than, uh, than, than you can feed at um, uh, with uh, with data at. So we measured this in a bunch of common frameworks and we found anywhere between 5 and 30x overhead, even in well-optimized frameworks. So for example, in Pandas, NumPy, and TensorFlow, individual functions are written in C. Uh, they're highly optimized, but any real application is going to combine lots of them. And this overhead of composing these high-level APIs dominates. Now, of course, People love high-level APIs, so we don't want to go and tell everyone, you know, please write your entire sequence of functions in C and tune them together to minimize data movement. We want to keep the high-level APIs, but still give you excellent performance, the same that an expert uh, software engineer would have written for this application. And uh, the way we do that in Weld is by creating basically a common runtime uh, and, and a common language for these libraries that enables us to do cross-function optimizations. So in particular in Weld, every library you're using, whatever type of computation it's doing, maybe it's doing table uh, tabular processing or linear algebra or something like that, uh, it expresses its computation in a common intermediate representation, or IR. Um, same way that a lot of libraries actually optimize each function by writing it in C, we're asking them to write it in this small functional language, think of something with maps and reduces, that's designed to enable uh, really easy cross-function optimization and to let us minimize uh, the data movement. And then the world runtime takes this and can run it on diverse hardware. The Weld IR is also parallel, and because it's purely functional, it's easy to parallelize, so we can all actually automatically run it on parallel hardware as well. So that's the idea. You add this in the most commonly used functions, and then the compiler will see how you've composed them and run them. So how does it do? Um, it turns out even adding Weld to just, say, the 10 most common functions in each framework can give you significant speed up. So in this case, we added it to Spark SQL, NumPy, and TensorFlow, and uh, we, we just added it to a few functions in each one, but we get anywhere between a 5 and 10x speed up uh, in, in all these applications. So that's pretty good to have. You can just use the same API and get a speed up. Um, and then if you have a more complex application that uses more libraries, you can get even larger speedups. So in this case, this is a more complicated pandas and numpy workload from the pandas uh, tutorial. And what we see is if we just add weld 
in each library, we get a factor of nine. That's not too bad. Um, if we enable cross library optimization, we get a factor of 30 speed up. Uh, and then, well, um, the, the intermediate language is also um, very easy to parallelize, and we have a multi core backend. So, just turning that on gives us another factor of eight uh, to run the whole thing over 200 times faster. So it's uh, really nice to see that you can get these significant speed ups automatically under existing high level APIs. And as a data scientist, you don't really have to worry about uh, changing the way you write code. You can still use this ecosystem of packages and get these. So Weld is open source. Um, we uh, all have also released uh, integrations uh, with subsets of NumPy and Pandas. And we also have a research paper about it. So I invite you to check that out. So the final thing I'll talk about is a new project, and uh, it um, it addresses you know one of the questions that comes up with Weld. So when you look at Weld, you might say, well, it's awesome. You can get these speed ups underneath today's high level APIs, but do we really need to rewrite our libraries in a functional language? You know, as fun as that is, um, it's a bunch of work to do that. Um, and it turns out actually that in many cases you don't have to. Um, so we have this new project called Splitability Annotations that does. Uh, Two of the key optimizations in Weld, namely data movement and automatic parallelization, underneath unmodified black box functions. You can even apply this to closed source libraries, actually, and speed up workloads using these libraries without having access to their source code. So it doesn't do everything that Weld does, but it actually does the two most important optimizations. So let me briefly explain how this works. Let's imagine someone wrote a really optimized function, like say this is a linear algebra function in C that can add a bunch of vectors. And you know they spend lots of time, they coded it in assembly, it's super fast, um, and, um, and it's awesome. If all you're doing in your application is adding two vectors, this is great. Uh, you know, it's perfect. So, so this particular function, you give it two vectors and you give it a result to write in, and you just call that, and it's awesome, and you've computed them. But a real application might uh, do uh, multiple operations. It's probably not just computing a single sum. And so as soon as you start calling this function multiple times, like in this example, we're trying to add four vectors into the result, um, you end up getting a lot of data movement because each call to the function scans both the arguments and the output. And so we're going over this result vector lots of times to add in everything here. So how can we accelerate this? You know, we don't uh, we don't want to change the code of VDAD. Maybe we don't even have it. Um, with splitability annotations, what we can do is add a simple annotation to the function that tells the system how you can uh, split up the inputs to this function um, into into little pieces and still get the same result. So in particular, add is an element-wise operation. So if we've got these vectors as input, it's safe to split them into chunks that are equal size, like say 10 elements each, and call it separately on each chunk, and we'll get the same result. Um, in this, so splitability annotations basically assign a type to each argument, and we have a, a, a type system that lets you reason about which ways it's safe to split them. So in this case, we're just saying they have to be split in the same way, but we don't care what that way is. And just adding this uh, to an existing library can give you significant speed ups. So in this application, we implemented the repeated add using MKL, uh, again, a state of the art um, optimized uh, linear algebra library. Um, and what we see is it gives us these large speed ups both on a single core and also on multiple cores. So MKL, even though the add function is highly optimized, uh, it spends a lot of time doing data movement. And actually, you can see it kind of stops going faster after around eight threads because it's uh, filled up the memory bandwidth of the system, and it can't really do anymore. In contrast, MKL with our annotations can go significantly faster and also scales well all the way up to 32 threads on this machine uh, because uh, it can actually pipeline uh, the, the computation. So basically, it will take little pieces of data, uh, like a few hundred elements, and call all the operations on that piece while keeping it in the cache. And you'll get uh, dramatic speed up because you have fewer accesses to main memory. 
So overall, we found that splitability annotations can often match the results of systems like well that require recompiling the entire application. And of course, they can be written uh, on top of any existing library. It's less work, and you don't even have to have the source code. Um, so we've implemented these in a system called Mozart. And you can see, especially on large number of threads where data movement is pretty much the only thing that matters, uh, they come uh, within 10% of weld. In some cases, they also go faster. So in this case, for example, weld doesn't do uh, some of the code level optimizations that MKL does, and we can leverage all of those uh, and go faster than both weld and MKL. Um, so this system is still under development, but we expect to have a paper on archive uh, about it soon, and I invite you to read more about it there. So to conclude, uh, Don combines algorithms and systems work to simplify building ML applications end to end. And the goal is to eliminate these teams for these large teams and just uh, these needs for these large teams and just let a single data scientist or domain expert be productive building an application. I invite you to check out more about the project on our blog. Thanks.